Our guest today has written one of the best introductory, comprehensive books on defending the Christian faith, in my opinion. It's in its second edition, and he has been doing apologetics for over four decades. My guest today is Dr. Doug Groteis, and we're going to talk about trends in apologetics, uh, the evidence for God, the historical Jesus, tough questions people are asking. So buckle your seatbelts. Our focus is going to be on his new update to his book called Christian Apologetics, which when I have one text to offer to skeptics and Christians who say, I want to understand a comprehensive case for Christianity. Doug, it is right up there for me with evidence that demands a verdict. Those are two of the top ones I suggest. Mm -hmm. So thanks for a great job in this book and thanks for coming on the show. Well, you're welcome. I'm really grateful for your work and of course your dad's work all these all these years. He's been doing apologetics for how long? Seventy years? <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only at forty. <laughs> well, I'm sure he would take that as a compliment. But yeah. I before we get into your book, one thing I realized I hadn't heard when I was going through your book is your story just becoming a Christian. Did you grow up in a skeptical home? Did you grow up in the church? What's your journey to becoming a believer? Well, I grew up in what I would call a a God-fearing home. My parents mm -hmm. uh, certainly believed in God, and my mom especially prayed. And but we didn't go to church very much. So when I was in high school, I got interested in Eastern religions, especially through certain rock musicians like uh, Carlos Santana and John McLaughlin, who was jazz rock. So I thought maybe they were onto something. Todd Rundgren, these people. And so I began to read a bit about Eastern religions. Never got that deep into it. But in my first year in college, University of Northern Colorado, I uh, started studying philosophy <clears throat> and also got very interested in atheists like Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, Sigmund Freud. So I had sort of this Eastern mystical interest and then this Western atheist interest. Wow. And uh, at the same time, uh, the Lord was really pursuing me because I met some folks in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, if you're a hippie in 1976 in Greeley, you definitely want to hitchhike to Boulder. It's a lot more interesting than Greeley. But little did I know there were two young women in the Navigators there who witnessed to me and started praying for me. Mm. And uh, I had some pretty amazing experiences before I became a Christian that showed me God was after me. One of them was uh, reading some passages from this book by uh, Soren Kierkegaard called The Sickness Unto Death. Wow. And uh, the book really defined me. I was in rebellion against God, especially in as much as I was trying to be like Friedrich Nietzsche and be the overman and throw off all the shackles of tradition and so on. But I had this very strange dream once. Uh, in the middle of the night, I got up, started reading this Kierkegaard book, and I felt like God was speaking to me through that book. So <clears throat> I started to take Christianity more seriously. And I went home that summer to Anchorage, Alaska. And about half of my high school friends had converted to Christianity and half had not. So I was like right in the middle of both groups. Hmm. And I began to talk with them and read the Bible. And uh, the Lord showed himself to me in various ways through conjunctions of circumstances. So I became a Christian about... 47 or 46 years ago. Right? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Haven't looked back. You know, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Have you had any serious stage of doubt, though? Like, have you ever looked back and thought, did I make an emotional decision? Was it experiential? By not turning back, does that include not having doubts or having doubts and just moving mm -hmm. amidst, amidst them? Yeah, mostly having questions here and there. And I've tried to pursue the questions I've had the best I can. So along the way, uh, I've really dealt with all the major world religions and secular philosophies. And I've written and spoken about just about all of them. Hmm. And I've had the time. God's given me a lot of room over the years to read, write, study, teach, preach, mentor, debate. Uh, so I'm a very blessed man. And I've never been intellectually timid. I think I was maybe for the first few months of being a Christian, I didn't have a good theology of the intellect. But then once I started reading people like Francis Schaeffer and mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis and Os Guinness and James Sire, then I, I was in mm -hmm. Christianity is true, rational, and let's outthink the world for Christ. 
So that's what I've tried to do over the years. So it sounds like, if I understand correctly, some of the apologetics came downstream from just reading the scriptures, encountering Christ, mm-hmm. rather than being barriers you had to cross before becoming a Christian. Yes, I think my conversion was not so much uh, hear all these terrific arguments for Christianity. It was more that I felt that God was pursuing me. And reading that material from Kierkegaard was very compelling because Kierkegaard was a subjective apologist in the sense that he tries to explain the human condition in Christian categories such that people will realize that they are sinners before God and need to repent. Now, he does so in a very sophisticated and somewhat difficult way, but that was exactly what I needed to hear, uh, read rather, in my dorm room in 1976. But it was after that that I started thinking about, well, I left behind the secular philosophy and these Eastern religions, but what do they really have to offer? Um, Are they false? And one thing that happened is very significant, excuse me, is right before I became a Christian, I went hiking with a friend of mine. And I told him I was thinking of becoming a Christian. He was not a Christian. He said, Doug, if you become a Christian, you'll just spend time with church people You'll read Christian books, you'll go to Christian concerts, and you won't be a critical thinker anymore. Hmm. Well, John Karpoff, I've spent the last 46 years refuting that. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Doug, one question I have for you is you've been doing apologetics for decades plus. I uh, had a chance when I updated evidence to be on his with my dad. I think he's actually celebrating six decades of ministry. And it was able to get a lot of perspective how the arguments have changed, how culture has changed, how our approach should change. I realize this is a huge question, but in the four decades you've been doing this, how have you seen apologetics just shift in the church or outside the church? Right. I think one significant positive shift is the intelligent design movement. Mm. Uh, because when I became a Christian in the 70s, you had some critiques of Darwinism out there. Uh, And I followed those uh, critiques by people like Henry Morris and Dwayne Gish. But the positive argument on how to detect design in biology and cosmology was not that developed. And really with Philip Johnson's book, Darwin on Trial in the early 90s, and then the work of so many people like Stephen Meyer and Bill Dembski and Mike Behe, I think the argument from design in biology and cosmology is extremely powerful. Hmm. And I'm very excited about that. In the second edition, I've updated those chapters as well. And the arguments just keep getting better and better. And the arguments against design, detectable in nature, are extremely weak. In fact, nobody has ever refuted Michael Behe's irreducible complexity argument. And he keeps track of it. He's got a whole book this big just responding to the critics over the years. So I'm very hardened. Of course, that's only one part of apologetics, but sure. it defeats naturalism and it makes theism the most likely worldview. So you go from there into the reliability of scripture, deity of Christ, resurrection of Christ, and all the rest of it. So that is very heartening. And of course, along the way, you have to deal with various challenges. In the late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of that was postmodernism. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a book on postmodernism called Truth Decay. Great book. And, uh, thank you. And so I've tried to keep up on the various issues. I think one of the biggest issues now, and I updated Christian apologetics on this a little bit, is the charge that Christianity is hostile to LGBTQ people. Mm. That a biblical sexual ethic is repressive, cruel, etc., So that's not my area of expertise, but I did update my chapter uh, that deals with objections to Christianity. It's called um, Distortions of Christianity or the God I Don't Believe in. So that section now is probably twice as long as it was Hmm. in the first edition, which dealt mostly just with homosexuality. And I've extended that uh, quite a bit. So what I've tried to do is develop my chops apologetically keep up with the most pertinent challenges to the Christian faith. Some of them are perennial, like the problem of evil, reliability of scripture. And then there are others that come up that just get the spotlight. Um, A lot of that now is going to be race and gender. 
so I have tried to update a bit on those issues as well. I'm curious if you think the way apologetics is being done has shifted. And I'll give you a couple examples that my dad shared with me. He said when he used to, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, speak on college campuses, before the postmodern turn, there was kind of an assumption that there's such a thing as truth, that we can know it. The question is, what is true? And then some of the shifts changed to truth being intolerant, truth being bigoted, truth being unknowable. That was yeah. one big shift. I think another shift is a lot of things have shifted and this overlaps with Christianity not just being false to now Christianity is not good and even if it were true mm -hmm. I wouldn't believe it because of one example of this being the LGBTQ conversation in terms of a big picture I would also say a lot of apologetics has clearly shifted online which is one reason we're having this conversation here is it's completely shifted to YouTube and social media mm -hmm. Books still matter, or I wouldn't write them, or you wouldn't write them. Oh, but that's I hope a, so. <laughs> they do matter. I spent a lot of time on this thing. <laughs> I know you did. It's great. It's one of my yeah. favorites in its realm. But or I'm just mm -hmm. asking big areas of the way apologetics is done. I also think there's a shift from the debate culture to a lot more conversation, and people are responding to that. But do you notice any other big big shifts in how apologetics mm -hmm. is done? I agree with all that because hmm. we don't know, we not only want to say Christianity is true, but we have to defend the idea of objective truth and that objective truth in many areas, at least is knowable. And we need to appeal to reason and evidence and use classical forms of logic and so on. And all that is debated now. Some people are even rejecting standard logic as white male oppressive that's been going on for a long time i dealt with that in truth decay but we're seeing it now again with some aspects of critical race theory and so on so it's like you have to move the discussion back several levels mm. i think 30 years ago let's say i'm at the university of oregon and i give a lecture on the resurrection of jesus i don't have a prelude on what truth is basically i just say there's evidence that jesus rose from the dead and here it is if I am going to talk about the nature of truth, rationality, how we know things about history, then go into the, the evidence and the arguments. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, again, when my dad first wrote evidence, there were no chapters on truth. He just launched into it. Right, right. Then in the yep. 1999 version, there was one, maybe two chapters in the back on postmodernism. In this recent one, we did three because right. there's just so many more objections. That's a good way of saying we've moved it back to more meta questions we have to cover mm -hmm. before we can even get to the evidence itself. That's a really helpful yeah. way. Yeah, and to... Francis Schaeffer was onto that even in 1968. Mm -hmm. You know, the way he started The God Who Is There, he said the whole problem between the generations is a different concept of truth. And that's only amplified in the decades after that. And one issue we have to deal with now, I don't really deal with it so much in Christian apologetics, but in another book that's coming out called Fire in the Streets is what's called Standpoint Epistemology. And this is a twist on postmodernism. Postmodernism said there's not one true narrative of reality. We have various narratives, but the meta narratives, the big narratives like Christianity and so on are false because they're mean and they're oppressive. But there wasn't this hard emphasis that there's one narrative that just trumps everybody else's and now that's what we see with the notion that if people have been historically oppressed or marginalized then their standpoint is automatically true mm -hmm. and it must not be challenged so there's this appeal to lived experience as the trump card is the final word on everything so it's like absolutism has come back and it's become genderized and uh, ethnic which is a different kind of perspective. So we've still got to defend the idea of a statement is true if it corresponds to reality, it's false if it doesn't, and we need good and sufficient evidence for whatever we believe. And part of that is the lived experience of marginalized oppressed peoples, uh, but that's not the whole story. So we've got to just keep doing epistemology. You, you can't get away from epistemology. How do we know what we know and what might refute the truth claims that we make. So let's have a well-informed, rational, 
discussion and let's do apologetics whenever and wherever we can. And I think you're right. The, the idea that the ultimate apologetic is a debate is probably not true anymore. Mm. I think debates are still good, panel discussions, things like that. But so much of what's going on now, of course, is podcasts, Facebook, Twitter, and you have to ask yourself, how much can I do for apologetics in a tweet? But uh, you might plant a little seed there that grows up into salvation in somebody's life. One of the things I've started doing on Twitter, I want to do it more, is just asking questions more than making statements. And I just, I interviewed a buddy who's a leader and he focuses on asking questions. And he said, it occurred to me that Jesus communicated by stories and by asking questions. Jesus is also the one who designed the human brain. So he designed us to respond and learn through questions. And I thought that's such a simple, brilliant point. So I changed a lot of my apologetic strategy in conversation, in talks, to intentionally incorporate more questions. And that's not really anything new today. That's just me catching up with the way Jesus, and even Paul, he asked at least 262 questions in his letters. So that's that's one way I've shifted in doing apologetics. In the four decades you've been doing this, or the 10 years since you updated this book, how, if at all, has your approach to doing apologetics or evangelism shifted? Or if it hasn't, why not? I don't know that it's really shifted a whole lot. One way that I accommodate questions is taking questions. So Mm. whenever I give a public talk, if at all possible, I like to leave at least 15 minutes to half an hour for questions and comments. So I will certainly raise questions in my apologetic work and in discussions. Uh, Certainly, if you're talking to an unbeliever, it's good to ask them what they believe, uh, why they believe what they believe, and then form a dialogue situation instead of, okay, I'll dump my Christian apologetic on you and just shut up and listen. Uh, You want to ask them what they believe and why, and then relate that to what you believe and why. And then you use all your skills, your knowledge in an improvisational setting. And I'm a big jazz lover, and I think we have something to learn from jazz because in jazz, you have to listen to what the other musicians are playing because you Hmm. play off each other through improvisation. It's called having big ears. You're listening to the bass player, Hmm. the drum, the piano player. And so it's an improvisational setting. And I view apologetic discussions as improvisational settings And of course you can improvise badly. You can hit the wrong notes, but if you've spent the time in the woodshed studying and so on, and if you're not afraid, you know, if you have the courage of your convictions, then it can be a a thrilling and wonderful situation or Hmm. it can be tough and unpleasant, but you know, get over it. (laughs) We just have to get out there and declare and defend the faith, whatever the result is. I love that because it shows a confidence in the faith. I'm not just going to speak and bail. I'm open to question. I'm open to criticism. There might be something I don't know. That's a great way to do apologetics. I love it. Now, I'm curious how you think the church's receptivity or interest in apologetics has changed over like the past four decades. And I have about half that time to gauge it for myself. But when I wrote my first book that's now out of print, it was reviewed and I think about... Oh, thank you. You get, you get old enough, it'll happen. <laughs> exactly. I hadn't quite viewed it that way, but I'll take that as a compliment. And it was reviewed in about 2006 in the Christian Research Journal. And the reviewer said one of a few but growing apologetics resources for students. Nobody would say that now. If anything, when somebody asks me, there's too many resources. And there's apologists on social media, apologists on YouTube. I think it's really grown. That's one metric of looking at it. What's your sense of the church's receptivity to the need for apologetics? Well, certainly there are more and more resources. Uh, Were you thinking of that book, Apologetics for a New Generation? No, that's still in print. I was thinking of ethics, E-T-H-I-X. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, you're right. There's so many resources out there. I think of Mama Bear Apologetics and, Mm. you know, Lee Strobel did versions of his books for teens. So there are so many good resources out there. Uh, I don't know that I have a good read on the whole church, but 
I think there's more room for apologetics in sermons and in seminars and in adult ed classes, certainly. Um, I hope that any evangelical seminary will have a strong apologetics class and will show that this is very pertinent to the whole presentation of the Christian faith. It's not an option. It's one element of a holistic view of Christianity. But overall, when I look back, I think of uh, the terrific apologetic ministries that have sprung up, the various master's degrees in apologetics that are available. Yeah. And there are some very good resources on the internet. There's some not so good resources. One of the things about the internet is that if you know how to produce something and it's slick enough and you have a brand that people like, you don't even have to know that much. Uh, so, that is true. You know, there are some people out there doing apologetics that really have not a lot of credibility or background, but they're very good at doing YouTube video or very good at doing a podcast. And maybe I'm just an old fussy philosopher, but uh, I want to see some credentials. And uh, certainly there are autodidacts, you know, people who teach themselves a lot and it's worthwhile. But that's one of the dangers of apologetics, I think. It's, it was Rob Bowman used to call uh, schlock apologetics, that you can be too popular, you can be too simple, you can be too approachable and not really do justice to the topic. But I'm think, overall, I'm very glad if pe just so many people are out there, ministries, possibilities, you can hear lectures and debates and really good discussions. I think of Justin Brierley's program. Great. Uh, his podcast, What what is that called again? Un unbelievable. Unbelievable, yeah. And it, I might be doing one with the Progressive Christian. We're trying to set that up. So that could good. be quite interesting because I'm a regressive Christian. So I, I need to <laughs> progressive Christian. You know what, Doug, I think this is a really interesting point that authority has changed. In the past, when apologetics was done, if you were going to speak, there was a church or a conference that would vet you. If you're going to write a book, there was a publisher that would vet the book and your credentials to be a professor. There were certain gatekeepers, for better or worse, that would make sure you knew what you're talking about. Now, all you got to do is be winsome and creative on TikTok. All you have to do is be good at YouTube. And I, I some, one person was comparing me to another YouTuber. This is probably five years ago when I was just kind of starting. And they're like, well, this person gets so many more hits. Clearly, they know what they're talking about more than me, who at that time was working on my PhD. Now, I'm not saying I'm right because I have a PhD. I'm just saying in that person's mind, they associate authority with clicks and yeah. views and subscribers. Yeah. Right. And that's a dangerous, dangerous thing. So that's a great example of a shift. Now, I'm curious with you, right. have you changed your mind on any issues, in particular in this book? Again, if you just uh, tuned in, this we're talking with Doug Grotice, what I would consider the best comprehensive, I would say intermediate level book on Christian apologetics. You're not writing for scholars, but you're not writing for just total lay people. It's an understandable book, deeply comprehensive, laying out the case for apologetics since the beginning of this book 10 years ago as you revisit some of these arguments are there any that you're like you know what that was not as strong as i thought took it out are there any arguments that you added have you changed your mind on any big issues no next question no? <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. I, not not big issues now i taught the, okay. my own textbook for about seven or eight years before i decided to do a revision so I would go through and I'd make a few notes. In fact, I remember one pointed out a premise and an argument that I had that was just completely unneeded and didn't fit the argument. I think it was in my uh, intel, one of my intelligent design chapters. And I looked at it and I said, you're right. And so I took that out. That was not a big deal. Mm. It's really has been omitting some of the controversial issues 10 years ago about the emerging church. Gotcha. So I had some critiques of some of the emerging church people, which I just took out. I think there's still good critiques, but these people are not so much in the limelight anymore. But the big change in the book is addition. I have eight new chapters. In fact, so many new chapters that I didn't even count them properly. So um, <laughs> on page, on the preface to the second edition, I said, there's an addition of seven new chapters. And then I went through and highlighted all of them. There's actually eight. So if there's, 
if there's a second printing here, we'll fix that. That's funny. I've so done that myself. Yeah. Um, if you, I, I realize you're obviously taking a comprehensive cumulative case approach to Christianity, which I take. If I was asked the strongest arguments, I'd probably point towards either the teleological or the cosmological. I think the moral argument is really strong. And I'd point towards the evidence for the resurrection. Mm -hmm. What would you point towards if somebody just said, narrow down to a couple of what you think are the strongest apologetic arguments for Christianity? Yeah. I think that's related to your situation, how you present it. I think actually all the arguments I give in the book are, are mm. strong. They're all mm. quite good because there's just so much good material out there and high level analytic philosophers doing this kind of work like J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig and so on. But let me give you a very specific example. I gave a lecture in a secular classroom a few years ago and after it was over, the student came up to me and said, just really quickly, what do you think the most powerful argument is for Christianity? And we didn't have a lot of time. So I gave him a, the argument for the resurrection of Jesus. Hmm. But it really will vary from person to person and place to place, honestly. Now, there is one argument that I think is very powerful and has a metaphysically rich conclusion, and that's the ontological argument. Mm. And I defend the ontological argument in my book, but you have to work at a very high level of abstraction to understand that argument. So unless I was speaking to a philosophy club or maybe debating a philosopher or something, I would probably not deal with that. In fact, I can't think of too many times, maybe only one time, where I had a discussion with an unbeliever about the ontological argument. Now, I taught it. A few weeks ago, I uh, am an adjunct at Colorado Christian University, and uh, I taught Anselm's version of it to my undergrads, and they seem to get it. Of course, that's really a Christian audience. Sure. So I wouldn't say that I have a favorite. Well, I, maybe I do have a favorite argument. Okay. And that, that's uh, Pascal's anthropological argument mm. that I've worked on over the years. And it's a one-step argument. He's arguing that the Christian account of the human condition is far more compelling logically and existentially than any other worldview, because we believe that humans are great by virtue of being created in God's image. And we're also fallen because of the reality of sin in human life. And only Christianity gets that combination right. So we see elements of greatness in intellect in art in moral heroism, and we see these horrible examples of evil in the human condition. Think of some of the things the Nazis did to children and so on. Or think about how people use their talents for evil. Like a great orator can use his or her talents at speaking to motivate people to do evil. So I like that argument quite a bit. Not too many apologists use it. Ken Samples uses it. But it's a, I think it's a pretty compelling argument. And I've given that argument in a lot of different settings, academically more popular. I've shared it with people informally. So I guess that argument is, is uh, very attractive to me. And I think I've done probably more work on that argument than oh. uh, a lot of other apologists have done. I think I'm sort of the guy that has developed that argument pretty thoroughly. Uh, so I, I might say that one, but it really depends okay. on who I'm talking. Yeah, I think that's that's smart and wise. Jesus approached people very differently based upon where they were at. So I think that's a, a great, wise approach. By the way, really quickly, I've used your book twice with advanced high school students at a private Christian school, about 10 or 12, mm -hmm. go through it in a semester. And without prompting them, both times they asked for an extra full block period to discuss the ontological argument. <laughs> yeah. both classes it's the That's only great. argument they were like this is interesting wait we got to explore this more i didn't prompt them not that mm -hmm. i would use it with typical high school students i've never used it with skeptics that i can remember although i discussed it with skeptics i've never made it a formal argument of my presentation so there's something there that has intrigued uh intrigued yeah. students now one of the things i think you added correct me if i'm wrong is i think you added the chapter on the argument from beauty 
to this right. updated book. Yeah. Tell me why you added added it and what your simple case would be. And I'm curious why you make a case because it was um, Peter Kreft who made somewhat tongue in cheek. He said, there is the music of Bach, therefore God exists. Either you see it or you don't. And so yeah. he's almost saying, we don't need to argue for this. It's just intuitive. And yet you included it and you argue for it. Why? Yeah. Well, it's a version of a design argument. You know, these arguments like cosmological design moral are really more like families. So you've got, for example, the principle of sufficient reason cosmological argument, the Kalam cosmological argument, the Thomistic cosmological argument, and so on. And with the design, you can talk about the design evident in biology or cosmology, or you can talk about a sense of design in beauty. Hmm. So the reason I included it is that beauty often touches people very profoundly. Uh, people can be deeply humbled and awestruck by great beauty, whether it's beauty of the natural world, uh, beautiful sunset, mountains, birds, fish, beautiful things, people. It can be beauty that is created by people, like let's say a painting or a jazz composition or something like that. So because it touches people so deeply and because Christianity should explain everything that matters to people, I thought that I would formulate an argument. A lot of uh, analytical philosophers don't deal with this argument so much because it's not quite as tight and explicitly formulatable as some of the ar other arguments. But it's a two-stage argument. What you say is that there is such a thing as objective beauty, mm -hmm. something that uh, evokes wonder and awe and appreciation. And you don't really have to define beauty perfectly, because I think it's more like, in many ways, we know it when we see it, or we develop a taste for it. But this argument will not work if there's not such a thing as objective beauty, because if it's all subjective, then all you need to explain it is your own psychology. So I argue that there is such a thing as objective beauty. And then also that Christianity best accounts for it. I mean, let's just talk about the beauty of interstellar space. Uh, my first wife, uh, Becky, who passed away a few years ago, wrote up an article, and I put this in the book, about a Russian scientist who was working on equations to understand something with respect to interstellar space or astronomy. And by writing the equations, he was an atheist at the time, he saw this great beauty reflected in his mathematics that was reflecting or trying to reflect the objective world of the universe. And he started believing in God. And then shortly after that, someone came and shared the gospel with him and he became a Christian. Wow. So the idea is that Christianity has the category to explain objective beauty. And that is that God is the ultimate source of beauty. And God is not only a designer of the fine tuning of the universe, such that conscious embodied entities exist, but he's also the great artist because he is a perfect mind and a perfect agent. And so we see tremendous beauty. One of my favorite beautiful things in the world is uh, fireweed in Alaska. It comes around in late July and goes through August and it grows wild. It's actually a weed, but you can see whole fields of bright purple fireweed. And uh, one of my favorite wow. photos is, is my wife, uh, Kathleen, standing surrounded by these giant fireweeds. So I think nobody, did, no human being designed a fireweed. But according to atheism, it's just there. There's no artist behind the universe. And naturalism doesn't have enough categories to give beauty its worth. Neither does pantheism or polytheism or anything else. So let me give you one example. I was talking to a fellow graduate student about 30 years ago. And we were looking at a beautiful sunset. And he said, whenever I see things like this, I just feel so grateful. And I said, who are you grateful to? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he just stopped. And that was the beginning of some profitable spiritual conversations with him. Because I said, I'm, I'm grateful to God. He's a great artist, something like that. And I found out that this young man had an experience with the Lord getting off of drugs years before that. 
but he had never really followed up with Jesus. So I tried to encourage him. We met a few times. I've lost track of them, but that was the point of contact with him was the beauty of the universe. And there's my question. You're talking about questions earlier. Yeah. So I could have said, you know what? God is the ultimate artist and we were designed to know beauty. I just said, who are you grateful to? Mm. And that's what began the discussion. That is a perfectly timed question. I, mm. I agree about beauty. It's become one of my favorite arguments, if you can even call it that, because evolution could in principle explain the beauty of, say, you know, a peacock's tail to attract a mate. But the problem is we find such superfluous beauty in the depths of the cell, in the depths of the ocean, as far as we can peer into the solar system that are not remotely attached mm -hmm. to reproductive benefit in any fashion. It's like an exaggeration and there's no naturalistic need for it. That's a signpost to something transcendent is what I would argue. But I like beauty and morality because it's something we feel, it's something we experience, something written on our hearts that I think has a deep longing we have for justice. We have a longing for beauty. Now, you mentioned earlier uh, your late wife, who uh, I noticed that you dedicated this book to her. I thought that was just fantastic and fitting. She passed away four years ago, and uh, you talk about how you're one of the smartest guys I know, but she was a bona fide genius. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you were helping her like tie her shoes. So just to see that, mm -hmm. how did that affect you? Number one, just your faith and or your approach to the problem of evil, because you have this chapter at the end of the book, and I haven't compared him yet, but you had a chapter in 2010, and then now you have a chapter 12 years later in 2022 on the problem of evil and suffering. Did it change your approach, refine your approach? Uh, I'd be curious to hear. Right. Well, the backstory is uh, my first wife was named Rebecca Merrill Grotheis, and she was a writer and editor. She was uh, in Mensa, which is a international high IQ society. Mm. Uh, she was smarter than I am. And she got dementia and uh, began to lose her abilities to speak and read. And she had a very rare form of dementia mm. called primary progressive aphasia. I write about this in my book, Walking Through Twilight, which I think in itself is an apologetic of how one Christian mm -hmm. philosopher dealt with suffering of his uh, brilliant wife. But what I did, Sean, is I added a chapter in the book called Lament as Christian Apologetic. Mm -hmm. So the problem of evil is how can we believe God is all good and all powerful when there is so much evil? Wouldn't he want a better world? And if he's good, he'd want a better world. If he's all powerful, he could create a better world. Okay, I spent 35 pages on that issue, and I think there are some good answers to it. But if you look at the flip side, you can say, which philosophy of life best equips us to suffer well? And I believe Christianity does. And centrally, because of our Savior, Jesus Christ, he suffered for us on the cross. He even said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet he rose again from the dead. So that means that for the Christian, suffering has meaning. We may not know the full extent of the meeting. Typically, we don't. But we do know that God doesn't waste our sorrows. And we know that we will be, because of the work of Christ, resurrected into an eternal world without pain, without tears, without curse. And I would often comfort Rebecca with the words of Revelation 21, 22. 1 Corinthians 15 will be raised incorruptible and so on. And so what I try to do through that experience is find or smelt or sculpt as much meaning as I could through the suffering. Mm -hmm. And I ultimately, as, as angry or confused as I got, I, I had to come back to our suffering and, and risen Savior. So that chapter says that what seems to be the weakest part of Christianity, or what is the biggest objection often it's the problem of evil, we can say, yes, there is evil in the world. There is unjust suffering. There's pain, chronic illness, you know, fatal illness, all the rest of it. But what worldview and what way of living and what God 
can give you the strength to persevere through suffering with a hope that will not disappoint us, as Paul says. He says in Romans 5, this hope will not disappoint us. And if I just have time for a, a brief story, sure, uh, which I didn't put in the book, I don't think, Walking Through Twilight, and that is uh, Becky and I were on our way to have dinner at Olive Garden. We loved Olive Garden, kind of middle brow Italian food. <laughs> you, you can afford that going bankrupt, right? And we're on our way there, and she knew what was happening to her, and she knew she, she was losing her intellect. And it was so terrible, and she was talking about it. And I said, I know, Becky, it's terrible, but one day we'll be in the new heavens and the new earth, and all this will be behind us. And she looked at me. And she said, but Doug, is it really true? Wow. And she was raised a Christian. Uh, she remembered when she was baptized, but she, she couldn't even remember not believing in Jesus as Savior. But uh, dementia and terrible suffering really troubles a soul and a body. And I said something that kind of surprised me. I think the Lord prompted me. I said, Becky, do you think I'm smart? And she said, yes. And I said, you remember that big apologetics book that I wrote? She said, yes. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. And I said, Becky, you edited every word of that book. Wow. And I assure you that what we believe is true. We have the good evidence for it. And see, this is a neglected aspect of apologetics. It helps us through our times of suffering and doubt. Because I had a lot of time where I didn't feel God's presence. I felt like I was abandoned by God. Everything was going wrong. I was way beyond what I could figure out what to do. But I knew that God was there. I could feel like he wasn't there, but I knew that he was. Because uh, Becky and I had worked very hard at our worldview. We tested, challenged. You know, She edited all my books up until the first edition of Christian Apologetics. And we had worked on her books together. And so I, you know, I could say, Becky, it's terrible, but we have a real hope that we can count on. That's a beautiful story. I love that you share that because doubt can be emotional. It can be relational. It can be moral. But having answers is one tool of dealing with it. We see this yeah. with John the Baptist, right? When he's in prison, right. he's doubting because he mm -hmm. knows his life is in jeopardy. And Jesus is like, hey... You know, raising the dead, our miracles performed, the gospel preached. It was a kind of apologetic to give him comfort amidst his pain. I remember our dear brother, uh, Nabil Qureshi, one of the great apologists who died way too young. He was doing weekly videos. And when mm -hmm. at some point getting near, you know, the end of his life, he did a video. It was like, let's just rehash the evidence of why I'm not abandoning my faith while I suffer. And I'll never forget that. It's just powerful. Mm -hmm. So... Thanks for sharing that and just loving your wife through this. It's a great example. I was watching from afar how you did a little bit of apologetics, but really took that time to love and care for your wife, as the scripture says. And, you know, we're glad you're remarried and back able to do apologetics again. But uh, yeah. really appreciate you sharing that. Mm -hmm. One of the chapters you include, and correct me if I'm wrong, and it was in the original book, but I didn't recall it, is you offer a defense of the church. Is that a new chapter? That's new. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell why me didn't you know that? <laughs> you say, why didn't you know that? <laughs> I can't even keep track of how many new chapters there are. So you're, you're off the hook. Well, that was the first chapter that I wanted to include if I did a second edition, because mm. uh, especially I'd say in the last 15 years, I've come to appreciate even more than, than I ever have how significant the church is for every aspect of the Christian life and the Christian's witness to the world. So I thought here I spent all this time defending the deity of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the logical coherence of the incarnation and all these things. And I don't say much of all, much of anything about the institution Jesus came to start, which is the church. And then I started reflecting on this and I realized that most apologetics books don't talk about this. And one of the key issues, and maybe this is a change in the social landscape is so many people say I'm spiritual, but not religious, or I love Jesus, but I don't need the church. Mm. Well, those are very wrong perspectives. So 
uh, what I do is I go from Christology to ecclesiology to say, if Jesus is the divine crucified and risen savior, uh, he came to build a church and he said the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So I give an apologetic for the church from scripture. I talk about the need to be associated with a historic tradition. You can't just do everything on your own. And moreover, that the church itself, when we're following Christ, is an apologetic for Christianity. You know, Jesus said, by this will all people know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So if we're loving each other through thick and thin in the church, that's a witness to the world. It's a mm -hmm. powerful one. Or in the worship service, Paul says, if an unbeliever comes in and senses the Holy Spirit in your midst, he'll fall down and realize God is here. You know, he will recognize the reality of God in your service. So that was, uh, I think, the first new chapter that I wrote. And Catholic books on apologetics will emphasize the church. But typically, Protestant books don't. And I realized it was a big lacuna in my book. So I'm really happy that that is in there. And then also I added two chapters on the atonement because yeah. I only had. I only had like five or six pages on the atonement. Hmm. And as I taught it over the years, I kept thinking, well, I need to say more about this because Jesus came to atone for our sins. And I thought, well, if I can show you the New Testament is reliable and um, Jesus is divine and he's resurrected, then the atonement just fits in there perfectly. And it does. But what I realized is that a lot of people have philosophical and moral objections to the atonement. So I thought, well, I'll write another five pages. And I thought, I'll write another 10 pages. Uh-oh, <laughs> I need another chapter. Uh-oh, I need another new chapter. So I have a chapter called The Atonement Stating It Properly and then The Atonement Defending It. So I went back to the arch heretic, Socinus. That guy was a smart heretic. I mean, he had some pretty challenging arguments against the atonement. I went back and read those responded to those, went back and read Francis Turretin, uh, Bill Craig's recent work, Atonement and the Death yeah. of Christ. So I I don't think I've ever worked harder on anything in my academic career wow. than those two chapters. Very intense. Really? Yeah. Is that because the arguments are so hard or <laughs> like what, what made that so hard? Well, I think part of it was I had a pretty good theology of atonement, but I had never looked at it and tried to respond to the toughest objections to it. Mm. I just thought, well, you have a divine resurrected Christ. The atonement fits, fits the human condition. Uh, but there are people who say things like uh, Christ dying to take the punishment that we deserve is like divine child abuse. I'm sure you've heard that one. Yeah. So. Uh, I dealt with that and I dealt with the more serious arguments from Socinus. And I found actually that a fair number of evangelicals now uh, deny propitiation. They believe in substitution, but they deny that Christ actually took our punishment in our place. And I just rethought the whole thing. It's like, was I wrong about this? How could I be wrong about this? So I went back and read Socinus and read John Stott's book again, uh, The Cross of Christ, and looked at all these biblical texts and systematic theologies and all the rest of it. And I make the best case I can. The atonement is multifaceted. Right. You have propitiation, you have union, you have the defeat of the devil, you have the payment of a debt. You've got four or five key elements, but I see uh, propitiation, which is really Christ taking the wrath that we deserve in our place as at the center at the very center and, and someone like John Stott, Bill Craig, I think Francis Turretin would agree with that. I think it was so tough because I, I kind of gaslit myself a little bit because they're really smart theologians who said, we can have all the benefits of Christ without propitiation. We can do expiation, we can do substitution. And so I thought, could I have missed the point? Hmm. And I went back and no, nope, I didn't miss the point. Um, Propitiation is right at the heart of the gospel. And without it, I don't think you really have the essence of the work of Christ. 
So I worked that through very thoroughly, especially in 2020 when we were all hunkered down. So I spent a lot of time in, uh, in my bunker in Willow, Alaska. Just <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned a conversation with a progressive Christian. This is a topic many progressive Christians oh, yeah. bring up and criticize. So I imagine that may be a part of the conversation. Got it. Just a, ha a handful more for you. You have a chapter on the resurrection and you update it. Have you seen the issues related to the resurrection or the argument change or improve over this decade or even maybe further back? Um, I don't know that it's changed all that much. I know that um, some very conservative evangelicals are starting to challenge the minimal facts approach mm. as maybe lacking in some ways. I think of uh, Tim and Lydia McGrew are raising some questions about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the minimal facts approach is still very good. That is, you say we have certain facts that critical scholars tend to agree on. And you take those facts and you say, given those facts, the resurrection explains those facts better than any other theory. So I kept that approach. Uh, Bill Craig uses that, uh, Gary Habermas, uh, and so on. So I don't know that it's changed all that much from what I can tell. I know Gary Habermas has said that the leading theory against the physical resurrection of Christ is the probably the hallucination theory. Mm -hmm. So I added a little bit more content on that. I've never found that even close to being credible, but apparently in scholarly circles, uh, it has more traction than some of the other ideas. So I added a bit more on that. Good. Now, you did mention that this is not necessarily your lane, but that you included a chapter on it, the question of LGBTQ. This is one of the top two or three that I get, high school, college students, mm -hmm. from both Christians and non-Christians. And it's really not that Christianity is false, but that Christianity is not good. And even if it were true and teaches this hateful, harmful, homophobic doctrine, either I want nothing to do with it, or I'm going to embrace affirming arguments uh, as mm -hmm. many progressives have done. What's the heart of your response to this challenge? Well, the heart of it is that there is a God who designed us and he is the source of all that is good and right and true and beautiful, but we live in a fallen world. So God has laid out what his pattern is which is uh, there are two, there's one human race and two genders and one sanctioned way to be sexually intimate, and that is heterosexual monogamy. And anything that comes out of that is because of our brokenness and woundedness hmm. in light of the fall. And so every Christian is called to deny him or herself for the cause of Christ. For people who are heterosexual, it won't be same-sex attraction. For people who are same-sex attracted, that will be an area of self-denial. So I think in terms of the fundamental categories, Christianity is very direct. And also something I mentioned that if someone struggles with same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria, then we have the Holy Spirit. If we're truly a follower of Christ and we've confessed him as Lord, then we have the Holy Spirit to guide us and help us bring us into congruence with our biological sex. Some people miraculously change, like Rosaria Butterfield. She was a, a lesbian. She came to Christ. She became heterosexual. Other people don't have that story, but they still follow Christ. I think of two students that came to me over the years, two young men, and for whatever reason told me they were same-sex attracted, but uh, two of my students, and they both said, I know what the Bible teaches, and I know this will be an area of denial for me, but that's the path I have to walk as a follower mm. of Jesus. Now, if you say Christianity is true, but I don't want to follow Christian teachings, then you're in actually a satanic position. Because Satan knew, Lucifer knew who God was and he rebelled against him anyway. Mm. And so if you, you think Christianity is really objectively true and you don't like what it teaches, then you're in opposition to everything that is true and good and beautiful, just for the sake of your own little piddling ego. Wow. And that is, not a, that is not a good place to be. And if you want to understand a lot of the dynamic behind the uh, LGBTQ movement and the idea that the self determines reality, certainly read Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. 
that is a profound book of social criticism that explains where we're at. I agree 100%. I read that book twice, had a chance to interview him, and it is a game-changing okay. book. Uh, yeah. That if people watching this have not listened to that yet or pick up his book, mm -hmm. check it out now. Very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. A couple questions for you at the end. Uh, what advice would you give to younger apologists? You've done this four decades, debating, writing, conversations, speaking. What advice comes to your mind that you would encourage younger apologists or evangelists with? Mm -hmm. Well, don't put knowledge above character. Mm. I think the besetting sin of apologists is arrogance, because mm. after all, we're supposed to know what we believe and why and win all the arguments, right? But we need to be humble people, prayerful, and rely on the Holy Spirit for everything that we're doing, whether it's learning, writing, debating, having conversations. So never put your knowledge above your character. And also make sure that you continue to read and study and deny yourself in that area. Um, you may need to just not do some things that people tend to do. Uh, deny yourself some recreational activities so you can read mm. Carl Truman's book. Or you, know, or, you know, stop having fun and read this book. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, seriously, uh, the whole Christian life is self-denial. And if you're called to apologetics, you'll have to deny yourself to some extent just to put in the time. Mm. You know, reading and studying and writing is hard work. When I was doing those two chapters on the atonement, I thought this is a lot harder than I thought. I need to dig in. And I didn't just immediately have the answers. I had to really think and mull over. And in a lot of ways, I'd rather be at a jazz concert, you know, but <laughs> this, is, uh, this is what I'm called to do. You said two other things earlier I want to highlight. Number one, you went back to original sources and read Socinus directly. I encourage mm -hmm. my students regularly, don't just rely upon Christian apologists and their critique of Hume. Go read Hume yourself, think about it, and then compare it to Christian apologists and skeptics and make sure that it's right mm -hmm. and you're reading it fairly. Uh, right. And so, number one, read original sources, but number two, make sure we tackle the best arguments. I think that's great right. encouragement, I would add, from your example for young Christians. Now, I know you're not a prophet, and like me, you work at a nonprofit organization, but do you have any sense of where apologetics might be headed? And I ask that in the sense that going back 10 years, you're like, wow, I've got to add certain questions uh, on race have intersected with mm -hmm. apologetics more, the LGBTQ question. Uh, do you have any sense if you updated this in 10 years, if you had to guess, I know that's almost impossible to guess six months, let alone 10 years, but just any sense of where the trends are pointing towards? Well, I didn't deal with this in this book. I dealt with it a bit 25 years ago in my book, The Soul in Cyberspace. I think we're up to mm. seven copies sold on that book now, but, um, I think the issue of what is objectively real, because we've got the metaverse and we've got mm. virtual reality and some people want to have church somehow in the metaverse or they want to create an alternative identity that is maybe better than the identity we have here. So if we really believe as Christians that we are made in God's image and we were put here to thrive and love each other and serve God, then uh, do we want to live in an alternative world? Wow. So I dealt with that a bit 25 years ago when the technologies were pretty primitive, I guess, compared to now. But that may be a very big apologetic issue. And then also, I think pro-life apologetics is extremely significant. I don't really deal with that in the book. I, I view that as an ethical issue. But we do need to give an argument for why we believe in the sanctity of unborn human life. And it's only going to get more difficult and more contentious. So I salute people like Scott Klusendorf and um, any number of people. I've got a full-fledged apologetic for uh, being pro-life. I've given it and I've written about it elsewhere. But I didn't deal with it in this book because it was more what's the case for Christianity and then once you have Christianity, you can argue from Christianity for a pro-life position. But in some ways, you can also argue for a pro-life position even without assuming a Christian worldview. And that, that's another issue. Maybe we could do a show on that. Yeah. But I think 
the issue on what is real and what are the environments in which we should thrive when there's so many alternative sets of experience available to us. And then I think having really strong biblical and logical arguments about the pro-life issue because Roe versus Wade may be overturned and we're seeing a lot of nasty behavior and a lot of horrible statements on on this issue from the pro-choice side. So I think those are two really important issues. Maybe something else will pop up and I'll think, oh boy, here we go, third edition. <laughs> <laughs> if I live that long, I'm 65. Maybe you'll write the you'll write the third edition for me, Sean. Well, you know what? That's interesting. I would actually potentially entertain that. That's an interesting thought, but I'm going to have to do probably another update to evidence in another five years. And that was a two year project, three dozen grad students, 12 scholars. It's exhausting just to think about it. But uh, I, I want to tell our viewers again, your book, Christian Apologetics, Doug, I can't recommend it uh, more highly. We've used it in graduate classes in our apologetics MA program. I've used it with advanced high school students. And what you do that's unique is Evidence Demands Verge is more focused on the historical Jesus, evidence for scriptures, the resurrection. That's a piece of this. But you go into all sorts. You make a case for truth. You critique other worldviews. You take kind of an existentialist approach at times or the argument from beauty but you also look at science. I mean, it is a truly, as the subtitle says, a comprehensive case for the Christian faith. So if there are some skeptics out there that are like, where do we start to get a substantive apologetic for the Christian faith? I'd recommend your book, Christian Apologetics, right next to Evidence Demands Verdict, or Christian who goes, I need a summer project to defend my faith. I would put your book up there uh, right near the top. It's excellent. So I hope people will pick it up. And don't forget it while you're here uh, to join me at Biola. If you want to study this, all we've talked about in more depth, we have a fully online top-rated distance MA in apologetics program at Talbot School of Theology. And uh, we'd love to come beside you and teach you not only how to defend the faith uh, practically, but also in terms of the content itself. So information is blown. Don't forget to subscribe. Got some other conversations coming up on a range of issues you will not want to miss. Doug, you are a rock star. I'm grateful that you wrote this book. Appreciate your friendship and I uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. And just to be obnoxious, we have a fully online MA in apologetics and ethics at Denver Seminary. Also. Good, good. That's <laughs> excellent. You know, really quickly, tell, tell us about it really fast. Yeah, it's called uh, a master's degree in apologetics and ethics. So you deal with uh, the comprehensive case for Christianity. We deal with moral theory, ethical issues. There's a class on comparative religion called religious pluralism. I teach a class on C.S. Lewis. Wow. We have a class uh, called writing for publication, which I really enjoyed. I help students develop their writing skills and try to get published. And then we have the the core of Bible and theology from Denver Seminary. So actually, come live here. I like to be with people. <laughs> do, do the online. All right. Good, good for you. That's not obnoxious to mention at all. I obviously want our program to succeed, but I want yours to succeed. We are in this together. There is Absolutely. zero room for comp for competition. There's too much at stake. So thanks for writing a great book. Thanks for You're mentioning welcome. the program and really appreciate you coming on. Okay. Thanks much.